first of all, good morning to everybody. And let me thank, uh, uh, I would like to thank the organizer for, for this conference for inviting me. It is a very big pleasure for me to, to be here in a presence conference since, uh, since years indeed. It's the first conference I am invited in person since uh, three years. Yes. And uh, uh, when I was invited to, to this conference, I was asked to, to give two survey talks on a topic on which I'm working on since, uh, well, indeed, uh, since uh, quite a lot of time, since uh, uh, my, my, my master's degree studies. And uh, I, decided to, uh, I decided to split the content of these lectures into two parts. In the first part, uh, the lecture of today, I will uh, uh, concentrate on uh, all the requirements. So today it will be quite a didactical uh, talk. Uh, and uh, only in the, next, uh, in the next talk, I will present, uh, I will discuss about uh, recent results and, uh, and, um, and uh, actually also open problem. So, um, before, before starting to really, uh, to, to really speak about mathematics, I would like to, uh, to remember two, two persons, who, uh, two friends indeed, uh, that in these sad years we lost. The first person is, uh, is uh, my advisor, Baris Dubrovin, who sadly passed away three years ago, and also Bunsen Kim. Uh, well, of course, my interaction with Baris uh, has been uh, very, uh, very nice. I, I enjoyed a lot his uh, this time spent in Italy under his supervision. And uh, I would like to just to, to share a, 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 a memory about Boom Se Kim. Indeed, I hadn't the possibility to know him. I only interact with him only via emails when I was a student. You see, I sent him uh, several mails asking questions, and I was supposed to meet him in this conference. Uh, unluckily, uh, he, he recently passed away, and uh, I can only tell you that I remember very nice, uh, a very nice person. He always answered in a very kind way, and it was evident that uh, he was a man who was uh, able to speak about uh, mathematics in general, and algebraic geometry more in particular, in a very human, but also in a very natural way. So I would like to dedicate uh, these uh, lectures to, to them. And uh, I will uh, point out, uh, probably not today, but in the next lecture, some points in my research in which the work of Kim was indeed quite useful. So, but today I would like you, uh, uh, so I would like to, to as I said, uh, to, to give a quite didactical survey talk uh, about, uh, about a conjecture formulated in occasion of a 1998 ECM uh, by Dubrovin. And uh, before, even just for, for giving the, the complete statement of a conjecture, I needed to introduce several several objects. And uh, in particular, I will uh, start by, since you see, I cannot assume that all the, all the audience is, uh, is uh, used to work with Gromovitan theory, Frobenius manifolds, isomonodromy deformations. I had to, uh, to introduce these, these objects in the most gentle way I am able to do. So in the first part, I will uh, introduce quantum cohomology, and I will also discuss uh, its uh, Frobenius manifold structure. After that, I will introduce a remarkable equation, the quantum differential equation, which is attached to the quantum cohomology. After that, I will discuss, I will introduce some local invariants for the Frobenius manifold structure, uh, this monodromy data, we, and I uh, will also discuss about uh, the possibility to reconstruct the Frobenius manifold structure starting from this data via a Riemann Hilbert Birkhoff problem. Only after that, I will be able to, to give, uh, to discuss, the, uh, to introduce the statement of Dubrovin conjectures. 
and I, I will try today also to give a, a, a short history of evolution of a statement, a short, uh, a short history of evolution of a statement of a conjecture. So uh, let's start. So I would like to start uh, uh, with the first of, of my slides to uh, giving you immediately what is the dominant theme of his, of his research. Well, uh, essentially, my research focuses on the study of relations between three different aspects of a geometry of a variety. Namely, it's of a, well, a variety which is a, a smooth projective variety over the complex numbers. Well, these three aspects, namely, are its topology, its enumerative geometry, and its complex geometry. The way in which such a study is developed is via the analysis of the aeromorphic connections on the Riemann sphere and what are called their isomonodromy deformations. So, in the, in, this, uh, uh, in, the, in the first part of the talk, what I'm going to do is to introduce uh, what I mean by enumerative geometry. So, I will do a a very crash course on gromo witten theory and quantum, and quantum cohomology. So, roughly speaking, gromo witten theory is a, a theory which allows us to associate with any complex move projective variety a family of Frobenius algebras, and such a family is called the quantum cohomology of X. Uh, you have to imagine that, uh, so the way in which is a uh, uh, quantum cohomology can be looked at is a, a family of, uh, of deformations of a classical cohomological algebra with complex coefficients. And uh, uh, the point is that what you are doing is to deforming the classical cup product we have in cohomology. And the way in which uh, such a deformation of a product is performed is uh, uh, by introducing a deformation which involves counting numbers of rational curves on X. So, more in general, uh, let us... Uh, so, what Gromo-Witten invariants are? Well, morally, Gromo-Witten invariants are just the number counting curves on a space. So, let's consider our smooth projective variety X as a target space, and let's fix inside X some sub-varieties, V1, V2, Vn, and now consider, as I said, X as a target space of maps whose domain is a Riemann surface. In general, we can consider arbitrary genus, genus G. And let us decorate the curve with N punctures. So we have N marked points, pi 1, pi 2, blah, 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 pi N. We, we would like to consider those maps which maps these uh, marked points to um, so the images of these marked points, we impose that it, uh, uh, that it is an element of a fixed subvarieties V1, Vn, and moreover, we also fix the degree of a map. So we fix, we consider maps of fixed degree. Once we have uh, considered such a set of, of maps, we actually are interested in counting curves on X, so not parametrized curves, but real curves, so we quotient out by the automorphism group of a, of a marked Riemann surface. Well, morally, gromo witten invariants are just this number of curves, this number of unparametrized curves uh, satisfying, uh, as, uh, satisfying constraints of incidence, so we have incidence constraints, have, and with fixed degree. Uh, well, this is just, uh, uh, I mean, a uh, heuristic way to introduce gromo witten invariants. We can introduce more formally uh, gromo witten invariants uh, as intersection numbers on the Koncevich moduli space of stable maps of, well, here we have such a number equals to that integral. The integral is taken over the virtual fundamental class of the moduli space of stable curves of genus G, uh, and punctures, and of degree D. Here, these maps, these evaluation maps, are the canonical evaluation maps 
that we have from the moduli space. So a point in the moduli space is the datum of such a curve with punctures and F and the map. So by evaluation, what does it mean? Well, we, you just consider the evaluation of a map at one of the mark points. So what, we, what you do uh, is just you consider V1, Vn as cohomological classes, and you can pull back these classes to the moduli space via, via these evaluation maps, and then you can consider such, such an integral, which has to be defined in a in a very smart way, indeed. Well, as a general philosophy, um, as a general philosophy in mathematics, whenever you have a sequence of numbers, it is, uh, in order to study properties of these numbers, it is uh, much more convenient, typically, to collect all these numbers into a generating function and study properties of a generating function itself in order to deduce properties on the numerical sequence. Well, this is exactly what is happening here. You uh, so let us uh, introduce a, a, formal, a formal power series, which will be a generating uh, function for this Gromovitan invariant. But first of all, let me actually impose a further constraint uh, in the talk of both today and the, of the next time on uh, the variety X. I will always assume that the odd cohomology of X is vanishing. This will allow me to avoid uh, to introduce superstructures. So I will just speak about, about uh, Frobenius manifolds, but not about Frobenius supermanifolds. Uh, moreover, let me also fix, uh, once for all, an homogeneous basis, capital T T1, capital T2, capital Tn, of the classical cohomology of X with complex coefficients, and moreover, without loss of generality, we can even take the first element of a basis to be the unit of a classical cohomological ring. And uh, let me also introduce uh, the, the dual coordinates, small t1, small t2, small tn, dual coordinates to this basis. Once we have done that, we can indeed collect all the Gromovitan invariants with, I remember, uh, remember, as I said, um, before I introduced Gromovitan invariants with arbitrary genus, but actually we are interested in uh, genus zero. So we are counting rational curves. So I collect uh, uh, only Gromovitan invariants of genus zero and punctures, uh, target X, and with fixed degree D, and I consider a sum over all possible degrees and over all possible number of punctures. Of course, uh, we, we could deal with this, such a series as a formal object, but actually, uh, in these talks, we are interested in cases in which the, the function f uh, admits a non-empty domain of convergence. And uh, I will denote by omega such a non-empty domain of co convergence. Uh, we have two remarkable properties for this function, for this generating uh, series, uh, this Gromovitan potential in genus zero. The first remarkable property is its quasi-homogeneity property. Uh, so let me introduce on omega a vector field which is linear, whose components are linear affine with respect to the coordinates t alpha. In particular, let me introduce a bunch of numbers q alpha and r alpha in the following way. Uh, so Q alpha is defined as a half of a cohomological degree of a cohomological class capital T alpha, and R alpha equal, are such that such a linear combination of a, of a fixed basis capital T alpha equals the first chain class of X. So in particular, R alpha uh, is always zero unless um, unless uh, uh, capital T alpha is in the H2 group. Well, once we have introduced such, such a vector field that I will call the Euler vector field on omega, uh, the, our generating function, uh, our Gromovitan potential, satisfies such a remarkable property. If we consider the derivative of this generating function with respect to E, you obtain a rescaling of of the same function, 
uh, and the coefficient is given by 3 minus the complex dimension of a variety x plus at most quadratic terms in the, in the, in the coordinates t alpha. A second remarkable property of a Gromowitan potential in Gino zero is the fact that it, it gives us a solution of a remarkable system of uh, nonlinear PDEs of the third order known as Witten diagram Verlinde Verlinde equations, uh, or um, I mean, for simplicity, we'll call them WDVV equations. Um, let me first, uh, before introducing this equation, let me uh, also introduce a further gadget. I will denote by eta the Poincare pairing we have in cohomology. So uh, we consider this bilinear form eta defined on the classical cohomology of x with complex coefficients, it defined as follows. You take two cohomology classes, xi1 and xi2, and you define their pairing to be the integral of the classical cap product of the two cohomological classes. And uh, moreover, okay, and moreover, let me denote by eta alpha beta the pairing of the element, of the basis element in cohomology. Uh, once, well, uh, Poincaré duality tells us that uh, such a pairing is non-degenerate, so we can even uh, consider the inverse of such a matrix. And uh, this is uh, the WDVV uh, system of equations. Uh, so notice you have here a third derivative of the generating function with respect to the coordinates t alpha. Uh, times another third derivatives, and you also here have the inverse of the gram matrix of the Poincaré pairing. And uh, the difference of the, two, of the two sides of the equation is that the role of, of alpha and phi, these two indices, is, is exchanged. With, uh, with uh, these uh, properties, with these true properties, we can indeed uh, uh, define, as I told you, uh, the, our aim is to define a family of Frobenius algebras, which are the formation of a classical cohomology. So uh, in order to do that, I have to prescribe what is the product. So what is the, the new product I want to define? So indeed, I, I claim that we can define a product on a, each tangent space of a domain omega, uh, well, omega is, uh, can be identified with an open subset of a classical cohomology ring, seen as a vector space, a complex vector space, and the tangent spaces of this, of this domain can be naturally identified with a classical cohomology space, and of course, the, the, there is a canonical identification for doing that, and uh, once we have done this, we can, we can consider the third derivatives of these generating functions. We can uh, raise one index in this way by using the inverse of a Poincare metric. And in this way, we obtain a, a bunch of numbers, C alpha beta lambda, which indeed can be interpreted as components of a one to tensors, holomorphic one to tensors on omega. And we can use these components as a, a structure constants for the new products we want to define on the tangent space TP. So I underline that the derivative of this generating function is taken at the point P. And uh, I can define now a new product star P of the two uh, coordinated vector field, d over dt alpha and d over dt beta, in the following way. I use, so, as I said, I use these new um, I use these uh, components as uh, the structure constants for these new uh, Frobenius, for, these, for these algebras. And uh, it turns out that such a product is uh, extremely uh, rich of properties. Namely, it is commutative, and this is quite clear to, it is easy to see, but uh, remarkably, due to the uh, WDVV equations property satisfied by capital F, it is also an associative product. And uh, moreover, it, uh, the, the algebra uh, we obtain is also a unital algebra. We also have a unit, namely, it just coincides with a classical, with a unit of a classical cohomology algebra. Furthermore, again, the, always the WDVV equations 
are telling us something more, that actually the, the new product we have defined is compatible with the Poincaré metric in the following sense. Uh, any operator, essentially any operator of multiplication by a vector field is a self-adjoint with respect to, to the metric, to the Poincaré metric. So an object like that, a commutative associative unital algebra equipped with a uh, symmetric non-degenerate bilinear form, which is compatible in that way with a product, deserve a name. This is a Frobenius algebra. And, uh, well, the, the object I introduced is a prototypical example of, of what are called Frobenius manifolds. Uh, roughly speaking, Frobenius manifolds in, are complex manifolds whose tangent spaces admit a Frobenius algebra structure, and such a Frobenius algebra structure is holomorphically depending on the point. So, I repeat, we have, uh, on each tangent space, we have an associative product, commutative, unital. Moreover, we have a uh, non-degenerate symmetric uh, bilinear uh, form on, on M. I underline the fact that uh, it is not, uh, so it is not an Hermitian metric. It is not, uh, so it is a C bilinear. So it doesn't define any, any metric in a um, Riemannian sense. Um, and uh, which is compatible with a product. And uh, actually, uh, in order to have a Frobenius manifold structure, we also have to require that eta is flat. Well, in the previous example, in the example I introduced before, the, the metric was manifestly flat because, because in, this, in these coordinates, so in the coordinates t alpha, the ground matrix of this pairing is uh, just a, a constant matrix. So in, in our case, the, the, the uh, metric eta is automatically flat. Uh, Frobenius manifolds were introduced in the 90s by, by Dubrovin. Well, his interests uh, are actually, he was interested in uh, studying classification, the classification problem of two-dimensional topological field theories. Uh, and uh, it was in that way that he, he realized that uh, such, a, such a rich structure, such a rich geometrical structure uh, was arising in that classification problem. Let me also say that uh, actually uh, the first example of Frobenius manifolds uh, that appeared in literature, though implicitly, are in uh, uh, dates ba date back to the 70s, to the work of Kyoji Saito uh, in, the work, uh, in his work on primitive forms in singularity theory. And indeed, uh, two main examples coming from, uh, of Frobenius manifolds come from uh, uh, symplectic and algebraic geometry, Gromovitan theory, and this is the class I just introduced. Uh, another big class of Frobenius manifolds come from singularity theory. Uh, today, I, I, I don't have, I mean, in these lectures, I actually uh, not focus on this second class of, of uh, Frobenius manifolds, but let me also say one important feature of Frobenius manifolds. Well, Frobenius manifolds um, ap uh, appear to be uh, quite universal objects. If you Oftentimes, uh, when you are studying maybe a class of Frobenius manifolds, you realize that actually properties of this class of Frobenius manifolds actually are universal, in the sense that uh, uh, actually all true also for other classes of Frobenius manifolds. And uh, uh, in that sense, Frobenius manifolds may be seen as a, um, as a, as a bridge between mathematical theories which a priori are quite uh, apart from, from each other. An example, an example uh, mirror symmetry. Mirror symmetry can be recast as, a, as an isomorphism claim for Frobenius manifolds. Namely, uh, on the one hand, we have a Frobenius manifolds coming from enumerative symplectic geometry, quantum cohomology, which is the object I just introduced. And uh, another, on the other hand, we also have a Frobenius manifolds coming from singularity theory. Well, mirror symmetry uh, can indeed be recast as an isomorphism as such in, uh, in terms of Frobenius manifolds. Uh, 
Uh, one of the most important aspects of the analytical theory of Frobenius manifolds is the fact that uh, there is uh, uh, so the, there is the possibility to locally identify points of Frobenius manifolds, or more precisely, semi-simple points of the Frobenius manifolds. That is, those points of the Frobenius manifolds at which the corresponding Frobenius algebra is without nil potents with the space of deformation parameters of isomonodromic families of differential systems of size n times n, here n is the dimension of the Frobenius manifolds, of this type, where capital U is a diagonal matrix and capital V is an antisymmetric matrix. So uh, now what I want to do is uh, to, to, uh, to explain what does it mean. So, to explain what does it mean that we can locally identify uh, semi-simple points of Frobenius manifolds with uh, isomonodromic deformation parameters. In order to do that, let's start uh, uh, the construction starting from the Levi-Civita connection of the Poincaré metric eta. So, I recall you that eta is a flat metric. The uh, Levi-Civita connection is uh, uh, with a vanishing curvature, and uh, so it is a flat connection. And uh, now, what the first step in the construction is to introduce a pencil of connections labeled by a complex parameter z. And the way in which uh, such a new connection nabla z is defined is, uh, is as follows. You can so the, we have to define this object the covariant derivative of, uh, with, with uh, label z of the vector field y along x, well, we define by deforming the Levi-Civita connection of these uh, two vector fields. And the way in which we deform is by heading z times the product of the two vector fields. Well, uh, due to associativity of the product, so due to WDVV equations for for the Gromovitan potential, uh, we already have a, a remarkable statement. Whatever is the value of the complex number, such the connection nabla z is flat. So, okay, this is already a quite remarkable mm, statement, but actually something more is true. Indeed, what we can do is, uh, is the following. We can rigidify, we can take all this family, this pencil of connections, and we can rigidify uh, such a family into a unique connection, uh, nabla hat. So, uh, let me explain. So, here we have omega, the quantum cohomology. And uh, we can consider the product omega times c star. I will denote by pi the, the projection. And uh, I can consider the pullback of the tangent bundle of omega. And uh, what I want to do now is to define a connection on, on this pulled back uh, vector bundle. So, in order to do that, I need to prescribe uh, Christoffel symbols of two kinds. First, I have to prescribe Christoffel symbols along tangential directions to omega. And then I also have to give uh, Christoffel symbols along the C, C direction. Well, as I said, we want to rigidify the previous pencil. So along the tangential direction to omega, I just take I, I just take the same formula as before. And uh, what I do along the tangential direction to C star is the following. I consider the I consider such an expression for this covariant derivative. So I so now y is a section of this bundle. So, in other words, it is just a vector can be interpreted as a vector uh, field on omega whose coefficients are depending on a complex time z. And uh, I define as follows the value of this covariant derivative. I take the derivative, uh, the, the natural derivative of capital Y with respect to z, I had the product of y with the Euler vector field, so the previous vector field I introduced in order to speak about the quasi-homogeneity condition for the Gromovitan potential, minus 1 over z 
such such a, a such a vector field mu of y. Well, mu is a one-one tensor, is an endomorphism of of this tangent bundle, which is defined as follows: you rescale the the vector field y times two minus dimension of x over two minus the the Levi Civita, so the Levi Civita connection of eta. Um, the Levi Civita derivative of the Euler vector field with respect to y. Well, remarkably enough, such an extended deformed connection, uh, nabla hat, is flat. This was a big, uh, a, a big interesting result by, by an interesting object introduced by Dubrovin. And uh, well, since we have a flat connection, we can look for, uh, for uh, uh, for flat coordinates, in particular following Dubrovin, we can consider the following problem uh, to find. Sure. Omega. Okay, uh, I would like to ask. Two naive questions. Uh, firstly, how can I interpret omega? I believe you said it was it has a tangent as a tangent space at each point. The so, co the cohomology, right? Yeah, this is the first question. Yeah, that's the first. Okay, yeah. so let me first answer the first question. So omega uh, is I introduced omega as uh, the uh, non-empty convergence domain of a Gromov-Witten function of a Gromov-Witten oh. potential. So you see, uh, the way in which I introduce this generating function is a function of these coordinates on the cohomology. So that means that omega can be identified with an open subset of a classical cohomology of X seen as a complex vector space. In that sense, uh, in that sense uh, you see, you, have, you just have an open set in a vector space, there is a canonical way to identify tangent spaces to, to this open set with the, with the ambient space, right? And uh, in this sense, you have an identification of tangent spaces of omega with classical cohomology. Uh, yeah. you, want, uh, you had another question? Yes, yeah. that's clear. Thank you very much. Um, so secondly, my connection theory is a bit weak. Um, what did you mean with rigidification? You see, uh, no, I mean the following. I mean the following. Here is not, uh, probably is not uh, a technical term rigidification, but it, it gives you the idea. So you start with a, you just, you just have a pencil of connections on a, on a, same, on a same vector bundle. What you do is uh, to interpret this, uh, this pencil of connection as just uh, slices of, of, of a unique connection which is defined on this pulled back vector bundle. You see, rigidification is a, is a naive term, but I used it to give you the idea of what is going on, you see? Yeah, yeah. thank you very much. So, so, uh, as I said, uh, uh, nabla hat is flat. Nabla hat is flat. Uh, consequently, we can look for, uh, well, indeed, uh, nabla hat also induces a, a dual connection on the pullback of a dual vector bundle. And we can uh, consider the following problem. We would like to find function on this product, omega times C star, such that uh, nabla hat of a differential of f equals zero. We can rewrite such a flatness system also in terms of a gradient of f. A gradient with respect to what? With respect to the metric eta. And uh, in, such, in terms of such a vector field y, the flatness system is the following. So we have this, uh, we have this over-determined system of linear PDEs in, term, in, in y, we have uh, PDEs with respect to uh, coordinates that the alpha, which are given by the following expression. So we have uh, z times the covariant, uh, so uh, the coordinated vector field d over dt alpha, times 
the vector field y, and uh, with respect to z, uh, with respect to z, we have uh, this expression. So here u, uh, u and mu are what? So here in this system, I will interpret this system as uh, so by u, I essentially I am calling you this operator, the operator of multiplication by the Euler vector field, okay? And mu is uh, this operator I, I introduced here. So, so notice, notice one important thing. Uh, this system is not in Y, this system in Y is not a flatness condition in Y, in capital Y. Y defined as such, is not a flat vector field with respect to nabla hat. It is a gradient of a flat coordinate. That is a, the gradient of a function whose differential equals zero. Okay. Uh, okay, this is a system. Uh, this is a system we would like to, uh, to study this system. And uh, now, in order to do that, we will do a, a simplifying assumption. We will assume that omega is a semi-simple Frobenius manifold. That is, uh, there exists a point in omega whose, corresp whose corresponding Frobenius algebras is without impotence. Uh, automatically, this also implies the existence of an open dense subset in, uh, in omega uh, made of semi-simple point. Uh, if we have a semi-simple algebra as such, there exist idempotent vector fields, pi y, pi n, uh, idempotence in this sense that the product of pi i times pi j equals delta j pi i, and the, also due to the properties of compatibility of a product with, with, uh, with a metric, we also have this orthogonality condition on the idempotent vector fields. Uh, we have a theorem due to, due to sorry, are, are there any questions? No. So, uh, there is, a, we have a theorem uh, due to Dubrovin. The first theorem is that the, the Lie bracket of, a, uh, of, of two uh, vector, the important vector fields equals zero. That means that uh, the important vector fields uh, are coordinated vector fields uh, with respect to uh, a certain system of local holomorphic coordinates on omega. And indeed, we also have uh, a choice for this uh, local system of holomorphic coordinates, namely uh, the eigenvalues u1, un of the operator u. So you, take, you consider this operator of multiplication by the Euler vector field, uh, you number, you choose uh, an ordering for these, for these eigenvalues. Uh, the theorem uh, tells you that uh, in a naive broad of a semi-simple point, these coordinates uh, define a local system of holomorphic coordinates satisfying this. So the coordinated vector field equals the i've idempotent vector field. Uh, so what we have is the following. We have, uh, uh, we have this is omega. Inside omega, uh, consider a tangent space. Well, we have two frames. The blue one, the flat uh, coordinate uh, vector um, frame, and the idempotent frame, pi i. Actually, I will introduce a third frame, which is just a rescaling of the idempotent frame. I will introduce, more precisely, these vector fields fi by normalizing pi i uh, in, the in the following way. I choose, a, a, I choose a determination for this square root, and uh, I consider this, this uh, multiplication pi i times this scalar, 1 over this square root. And uh, I will now consider this system this differential system written in the orthonormalized idempotent frame. And I will also denote by psi the matrix which allows you to pass from the flat coordinated system to the orthonormalized idempotent one. So, uh, in that system, in that system, what you have is a, 
different, so in, in, the, in this orthonormalized frame, the second equation ob, uh, obtained a, a, a particularly nice expression. It is of the following form. Uh, dy over dz equals capital U plus 1 over z capital V times y. So U and V are matrices representing these two tensors, calligraphic Q, calligraphic mu, um, and mu, but in this orthonormalized frame. And in particular, one can, one can prove that indeed U is diagonal in, in these coordinates, and V is an antisymmetric matrix. So if we look at this equation uh, as an ODE, uh, on the, a linear ODE on the, complex, uh, on the complex plane, whose coefficients are uh, functions depending on the point of a quantum cohomology, so of omega. Uh, it is a linear ODE with rational coefficients, and we have two singularity. One singularity at zero, a Fuchsian singularity at zero, and an irregular singularity of Poincaré rank one at infinity. Well, due to, uh, so since this, uh, uh, so due to this uh, rationality of the coefficients, rationality with respect to z of the coefficients of this linear ODE, we expect that solutions are multivalued and they manifest a Stokes phenomenon due to the irregularity of of the singularity at infinity. And uh, in order to quantify both the monodromy and the Stokes phenomenon, we can introduce a bunch of, of matrices. And uh, let's do it. So in order to do that, uh, we have a different behavior at zero and at, at infinity. Indeed, at zero, as I said, we have a, a Fuchsian singularity, so we may look for formal solutions uh, of this equation, a formal solution expans expansion at zero of this equation, and uh, well, uh, one can prove that due uh, to the Fuchsian character of a singularity z equals zero, uh, one can prove that indeed such a formal solution is a convergent, define a convergent series. Uh, on the other hand, at infinity, we have an irregular singularity, so we can still look for formal solution with an, expo with an exponential behavior at, uh, at infinity. Uh, well, in such a case, uh, we, don't, we cannot expect any more convergence of a formal solution, but still we have in our hands an interesting, an interesting object because it is uh, giving us information about the genuine analytic solutions of the equation, and more precisely, it prescribes the uh, asymptotics, in the sense of Poincaré, uh, of, of, um, of, of, uh, of, of uh, genuine solutions in wide sectors uh, in C star. Or actually, better to say, in the universal cover of C star, which is the Riemann surface where solutions of this equation are well defined. So, uh, more precisely, uh, imagine you imagine to fix an oriented ray in the universal cover of C star. I will call L. Well, since it is oriented, we have a notion of right and the notion of left, and they can consider two uh, slightly enlarged alpha plane sectors in, uh, in, in the universal cover of C star, uh, one on the right and one on the left. Well, classical results on, on ODEs, due to classical result due to Shibuya, uh, is that uh, given a formal solution with exp uh, of, of equation uh, in, uh, in exponential, with, with exponential behavior at infinity, uh, there exist unique fundamental systems of solutions in the two sectors, y right, uh, so I, here y right and here y left, having as asymptotics the same given formal solutions, respectively in the right sector and in the left sector. So at the end of the day, what we have in our hands are three bases of uh, three bases of uh, 
for the space of solution of the same ODEs. So we can relate uh, uh, all these bases by uh, suitable matrices of change of bases. And uh, this is what monodromy data are. So in particular, I can introduce a central connection matrix, uh, capital C, which relates Y0 and YR. And I can also introduce a, a Stokes matrix, capital S, which relates YR and Y left. Excuse me. Shouldn't, shouldn't you have two Stokes matrices? One yeah. For... So this is a this is a very good question. So so uh, I will be brief, but I can give you details. So uh, the brief answer is yes. A priori, you should introduce two Stokes matrices. You see, in general, when you have an irregular singularity of Poincaré rank one, uh, you should expect to uh, have two different Stokes matrices relating. Y R, Y left, and another solution Y R, which is which is on the other sheet of the universal code. Uh, actually, and this is a very remarkable symmetry of the Frobenius manifolds case. Uh, uh, due to well, indeed, as I said, uh, these coefficients are quite. Uh, uh, are quite uh, special. You take the anti-symmetric and uh, you diagonal, and already these property are due to um, are due to uh, properties of these tensors. Uh, so what I want to say is that uh, is that uh, uh, you just have a single a single Stokes matrix because. Uh, you can prove that uh, even if you define a second one, it actually equals the transpose of the, of the other one. The, 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 the slogan uh, is the following. Frobenius manifolds are particularly um, rich of properties. We have a metric uh, on Frobenius manifolds. Such a metric is compatible with everything, with a product, with capital U, because, because capital U is just uh, indeed is, a, is an operator of multiplication by a vector field, so it is a self-adjoint with respect to, capi to eta, to the metric. Mu is uh, anti-symmetric. It is an easy exercise. You can prove uh, uh, very easily that it is uh, anti-symmetric with respect to eta. This explains this anti-symmetry. And also, uh, due to this fact, due, due to the presence of this uh, metric compatible with product and these coefficients, you can prove that indeed uh, uh, the number of relevant Stokes matrices is just one. Yeah. If in, you could work with more general objects rather than Frobenius manifolds, for example, um, F manifolds with a flat compatible flat structure. In that case, in that case, you don't have any more a metric. And in order to suitably quantify the Stokes phenomenon then yes, you need to introduce two, two, uh, two Stokes matrices. So the double of, of numerical parameters in order to, to properly quantify the Stokes phenomenon. Okay, so uh, let, me, let me just uh, uh, say the following. A priori, we can introduce these data, central connection matrix, Stokes matrix, uh, at each point, whenever I fix a point T of a quantum cohomology, I can repeat uh, this uh, procedure and they can introduce uh, and they can introduce uh, these two uh, numerical matrices. Remarkable property is the is, very, is an isomonodromicity property. These matrices are locally constant with respect to with respect to the point T. Uh, so they actually define local invariance for the, of a quantum cohomology. And uh, when I say, when I say uh, local invariance, I mean the following. So here, uh, I can skip these details. You see here, what I did was just uh, to show you the explicitly the expansion at zero and at infinity of the solution Y zero and the solution Y left and R. Um, so as I said here, capital Phi is a, a formal 
a priori a formal power series, but actually one can prove it is convergent if it, if it is a solution of this equation. And at infinity, we have, we have uh, an asymptotic expansion of this form. You, we have an exponential term at infinity and the formal power series in Z, which is not anymore convergent. But what I, so the, the picture I want to send is the following. You have to imagine that the quantum cohomology decomposes into pieces, and such a piece decomposition is a subordinate to the choice of the, of the right L. And inside, if you compute the value of the monodromy data inside the chamber, we call them L chambers, uh, well, it is constant inside the chamber, but you, you may have a wall crossing phenomenon. No, you have, not you may have. You have a wall crossing phenomenon. Uh, and uh, in order to, to describe this wall crossing phenomenon, you can, uh, uh, do that uh, by introducing an action of a braid group Bn on both Stokes and central connection, central connection matrices. Why, uh, why, uh, well, why the braid group uh, arise here? Uh, well, it's not that surprising because indeed imagine to have two points in two different chambers, and imagine to, to have a path connecting these two points, uh, so with starting and ending points in two different chambers, and uh, recall that we said that the eigenvalues of U are a coordinates system for, for semi, at semi-simple points of the Frobenius manifolds. Um, consequently, if you follow this path, if you follow this path, and if you look at, at uh, uh, the spectrum of a multiplication by the Euler vector field, you see that these parameters ui, these coordinates, starts to dance in the plane. And uh, recall that the, the braid group can be defined as, uh, indeed, as the mapping class group of a punctured plane, and in particular, my convention will be the following one. I will define, I will identify the generator, uh, this generator of a braid group with, a, uh, with this motion of, of the two points ui and ui plus one, a uh, counterclockwise rotation of uh, ui with respect to ui plus one, and all the others uh, uis are, are, are frozen. Yeah. So, so are so are real analytic are not so they, it's a real uh, decomposition of the Frobenius manifolds in a real analytic way. Um, how to de how to describe the walls? The walls are made of points at which this line L coincides with one of the Stokes rays of, uh, for this equation, you see? So uh, the Stokes rays are, are these rays which gives you the uh, difference of the, um, of the uh, behaviors of the exponentials E, Z times U, I. So these, these eigenvalues. So you have this bunch of rays in the plane for a fixed point of the Frobenius manifolds. And uh, you say that L is admissible if it, is, it, it does not coincide with any of these rays. So the walls of this chamber decomposition are defined exactly as those points at which uh, one, uh, the L coincides with one of these Stokes rays. Thank you for the question. Yeah. Well, you see, H2, H2 is, uh, deserves a special name in uh, literature, it's called the small quantum cohomology. Uh, well, of course, you have to imagine, uh, you have to imagine this locus as a, as a sublocus in this, uh, and of course, you may have, uh, so to say, a trace of this decomposition on the H2 locus. 
But you see, here I am describing like the big picture. Yeah. It happens, yeah, 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 yeah. It happens, yeah, yeah. Next, uh, next time I will show you explicitly um, an example, an example related to projective spaces. So, uh, so uh, there are many, uh, many details I, I am actually hiding. Uh, in particular, uh, in particular, as you can imagine, uh, the, the, the good definition of this uh, C, S, is uh, subordinate to the choice of several non-canonical choices of normalizations. I, am, I, I skipped all that, but uh, let me just say that the following, that uh, different choices of normalizations uh, uh, imply different uh, uh, numerical values for this data. And here I summarized, uh, I tried to summarize the, the effects of different choices of normalizations on the numerical values of these monodromy data. Uh, in particular, well, of course, we have an action of a symmetric group Sn because, well, well we can, as I said, we have to fix an ordering for the eigenvalues u1, un. And uh, if I change ordering, well, the matrix S and the matrix C are affected uh, as follows. Uh, P is just a permutation matrix. Also remember that we introduced these orthonormalized idempotent frames, so I had to choose, I had to choose the square roots. And uh, if I do a different choice of signs in the square root, then the numerical values are also affected. In that way, J is a, is a, mat a diagonal matrix along, and al along the diagonal you just have plus or minus ones. You also have an action of a, of a group Z is seen as a as the Galois group of a... Uh, so, um, more simply, it is just, uh, you see, uh, L, as I said, it is a uh, array in the universal cover of C star. So I have to choose a determination for the argument of a, for the argument of a slope of L. Uh, and in particular, if I if I choose uh, if I choose uh, uh, so if I change uh, a determination of this slope phi by adding multiples of 2 pi, uh, the only effect you have is on the central connection matrix, and the central connection matrix is affected as follows. It is multiplied on the left by k, the kth power of a monodromy uh, matrix M0. Uh, this, is the, this is the monodromy of a, notice that you see here, the solution Y0 uh, is of this form where you have uh, uh, well, a, do, um, a leading term, which is just the psi matrix, times a power series, times this part, and this, this term are the responsible for the monodromy, and here you are the monodromy. So, ah, so here are what is R, I forgot to say that it is a matrix representing the classical multiplication in cohomology by the first Chern class. So, sorry, I forgot to, to write in the, in the slides. And finally, uh, finally, let me also say that indeed uh, uh, there are, uh, there is no, okay, this R, the, the choice of R, as uh, just said, that is the choice of R as uh, the matrix uh, of representing the multiplication by the first chain class is not the unique one, it's not the only possible one. I, I, I have actually a space of possible choices. And uh, so I have a space of choices of solutions in level normal form. And uh, I, there, one can introduce a suitable uh, Lie group, complex Lie group, uh, which uh, quantify how the, how the monodromy data are affected by different choices of, of the solution in level normal form. If you are interested, I can give you details, but let's, let's move on. So an important, an important, uh, uh, an, important, uh, proper, uh, an important property of this monodromy data is the following. So we have a Frobenius manifold, and we introduced monodromy data. 
So these uh, matrices mu, r, s, and c, and we said that they are local invariants. Actually, what is very remarkable is the fact that uh, we can indeed reconstruct the Frobenius manifold structure starting from this, this bunch of numbers, these matrices, and uh, this can be done via riemann hilbert birkhoff boundary value problem. The moral of the story is the following, that the monotromy data actually define a system of coordinates in the space of quasi-homogeneous solutions of WDVV equations. And now, I, I, don't, I, I, will, I don't want to overwhelm you with too many details, but let me just uh, uh, explain to you the idea of how it is possible to reconstruct the Frobenius manifold structure via a Riemann-Hilbert problem. So, you, you, consider this, you consider this contour with these orientations. I will call gamma the union of all these uh, gamma minus infinity, gamma 1, gamma plus infinity, gamma 2. And uh, this will be the pi left sector, pi 0, and pi r. Uh, also, fix, uh, fix uh, a, a point u0, which is a tuple of coordinates u1, un, un uh, pairwise distinct. Here by delta, I am denoting the union of all the diagonal hyperplanes in Cn. So you never have ui equals uj, so to say. And so this will correspond to, the, to a tuple of canonical coordinates computed at a point inside a, a fixed L chamber. And uh, once you have uh, this data, let, one can also introduce this uh, piecewise analytic function on gamma, and uh, so here, capital U is just a diagonal matrix with entries, these, uh, the entries of this U0. You have uh, also to use S, C, and mu. And you can construct, OK, let's introduce this, this function H. And you may, you may formulate the following problem, this Riemann-Hilbert-Birkhoff boundary value problem. To find an analytic function G, defined on the complement of gamma with values matrices, such that if I restrict G to pi left, pi zero, pi right, well, it extends continuously to the, to the, uh, to the boundary of these domains. Moreover, there exist non-tangential limits G plus minus uh, at gamma. Here you, you have uh, the plus and minus sides uh, at gamma, uh, except uh, these two self-intersection points. And uh, moreover, these two limits are related to each other by the multiplication by such an h. And moreover, you assume that the solution at infinity has, uh, uh, goes to, infi to the identity, to the identity matrix. Well, it, it is a, a very interesting result by Malgrange. Uh, the fact that uh, if a solution of this problem exists at u0, then uh, the solvability of this, uh, of this problem is an open property. That is, there exists an open naive borrowed of u0 in the space of Cn, uh, at, which, at which a solution of this problem with u0 be replaced by another u, um, and, uh, and moreover, the solution is uh, a holomorphic function on, on U. Once you have uh, a solution of this problem, you consider just the restriction at pi zero. And uh, you expand the series up to the, and you take just the first four uh, coefficient. With this four coefficient, you are able, via explicit formulas, to reconstruct the, the gromov witten potential, the gromov witten potential or any other solution of WDVV equation. Uh, let me say just the following. Uh, I will be very brief here. Let me say the following. Uh, Saba uh, indeed recently obtained a, an interesting uh, extension of Malgrange, of Malgrange theorem uh, in the case in which the points U are not anymore assumed to be in the complement of a, a big diagonal. So now, uh, the, 
I mean, it's about consider this case in which uh, you may have some coalescences of, uh, of some equality of the two, uh, of two entries of U0. And uh, standing on that, I, I, I immediately realized that that theorem was important uh, in, uh, for example, uh, it was very relevant to uh, uh, if one wants to address the problem of, of proving that uh, actually the gromov witten potential is indeed convergent. You see, at the beginning I told you, assume that it is convergent. Okay, but the natural question is, okay, how to prove it is convergent? Well, uh, uh, I will be very short. Uh, just uh, uh, in the final case, for example, in the final case, uh, this statement simplifies a lot because you only have a single, a single assumption to do. So imagine, you see, uh, the product was defined by taking these third derivatives at a generic point. And uh, a priori one does not know if capital F is convergent. But even if it is just a formal series, I can always compute these derivatives at zero, and they are numbers. So we can introduce uh, just a finite dimensional complex um, Frobenius algebra uh, over C uh, just by taking the, the products at zero, at zero. Well, uh, one can prove, standing on both Malgrange theorem and Sabah, the Sabah extension, uh, that indeed, if this Frobenius algebra with this uh, product at the origin is semi-simple, then automatically the gromov witten potential is convergent on an empty omega. Okay, let's, uh, let me go on and let, uh, so now I have all the ingredients to, to properly define, to properly speak about the Dubrovin conjecture. So what is Dubrovin conjecture? It is a conjecture, as I said, which aims to create a bridge between the symplectic and the numerative geometry of X with its complex geometry in, in, uh, intended to be, uh, so incarnated in the derived category of coherent sheaves. And uh, the way in which uh, such a connection is created is by studying indeed the analysis of a monodromy of a quantum differential equation. The quantum differential equation, I, I don't remember, is, is this equation. For simplicity, we call it the quantum differential equation. Um, namely, Dubrovin uh, suggests that the, the monodromy data of a quantum differential equation are determined by the topology of X, intended to be uh, all, its, I mean, all its topological properties, dimension, characteristic classes, and so on, and, uh, uh, and characteristic classes of exceptional collections in the derived category of coherent sheaves. I recall you that these are ordered families of objects in the derived category, satisfying a minimality condition on the endomorphisms and the semi-orthogonality condition on, uh, uh, in the sense that you don't have no arrow from Ej to Ei whenever J is greater than I. So, uh, this is uh, the, I, I want to give you immediately the, uh, the statement of the Dubrovin conjecture. It uh, splits into two parts. We have a first part, which is a qualitative part. Uh, we, call it, we call it a qualitative part. And uh, a second part, which is a quantitative part. In the first qualitative part, the conjecture aims to describe the class of varieties X admitting a semi-simple quantum cohomology. Well, uh, the conjecture claims the following. Assume X be a Fano smooth projective variety over C with the Hodge diamond concentrated along the diagonal. This is a necessary condition if you want to have semi-simplicity, according to a theorem by Hertling, Manning, and Telemann. Um, the conjecture claims that the quantum cohomology is a semi-simple Frobenius manifold if and only if the derived category of coherent sheaves admit a full exceptional collection. Uh, let me recall that the fullness requirement uh, means that the collection generates in the, in the sense of triangulated categories 
the, the category uh, db of x. Let me also recall you that indeed we have an action of a braid group on the set of full exceptional collection. In particular, here I, I uh, for example, I recall you the definition of the left mutation of an object inside the category with respect to, to its uh, rightest one. Uh, so in, so in pre more precisely, if we start from a collection, E1, En, we can define the left mutation of this collection at the i position as the new collection in which I interchange uh, EI goes to the place of EI plus one with no change. But EI plus one is a, a modified one and uh, it is defined as the cone of, of a natural canonical uh, morphism you have uh, between these objects. Uh, so this define, one can prove that this defines indeed an action of a braid group. Prototypical example of uh, a full exceptional collection in the case of Pn is, the, is this one, is the Bellinson collection, O of one, O of two, O of n minus one. So this is the first part of, of a conjecture. The second part of a conjecture uh, claims the following. Fix an oriented ray L and denote by phi its slope. There is a map from L chambers to the set of full exceptional collections. So we associate to each L chamber a full exceptional collection such that the value of a Stokes matrix inside the chamber equals the inverse of the Gram matrix of a um, grothendieck euler poincare bilinear pairing in uh, K-theory uh, with respect to the basis obtained by projecting in K-theory the, um, the exceptional collection. And moreover, the central connection matrix inside the same chamber omega equals the matrix associated to the following morphism. So we, you have a morphism from the complexified K-theory to homology, and you associate to a, a K-theoretical class E the following characteristic class. You consider a, a slightly deformed version of the Chern character of E, and you twist it by, uh, by the following characteristic classes. You have uh, e minus pi i, the first churn class of x, times a characteristic class uh, of, of x that we call the gamma minus uh, class of x, um, defined as follows. You consider the Taylor expansion of a function gamma 1 minus t at t equals 0, and consider the product of this product where epsilon la l are the churn roots of a tangent bundle of x. Well, such a product is a symmetric expression in these churn roots, so you can expand it and you can uh, collect uh, the uh, elementary symmetric polynomials in these churn roots, and uh, now replace the kth elementary symmetric polynomial by the kth churn class of x. You obtain, at the end of the day, uh, a, a remarkable class whose coefficients are given by uh, special values of the Riemann zeta function involved in the, in the Taylor expansion of gamma. Um, so let me say something more. Uh, let me say something more. What, uh, so the picture is the following. To each chamber, you have attached a collection. Uh, S and C are determined by these exceptional collections. Recall that I told you that you have an action on the monodromy data. We have an action on uh, the exceptional collections. Indeed, the two are compatible. Uh, and moreover, let me also stress a, a, an interesting, a far very interesting point, which is the following. You see, if you take L, the oriented ray, and you let it rotate by two pi, uh, say counterclockwise, the chamber decomposition doesn't change. It is exactly the same. Uh, because I, I am, I am uh, you see, I am uh, thinking the Stokes rays as uh, rays in the complex plane, okay? Uh, you, otherwise, you can just consider all possible lifts 
of a Stokes race in the universal cover of C-star. And uh, so the, the L-chamber decomposition does not change, but the exceptional collection does. And uh, here you are the structure that appears. You see, when you have an exceptional collection, you can actually construct an infinite family of objects just by uh, iterating mutations on the left and on the right. For example, E0, what is? It is just uh, the subsequent mutations on the left of the objects EN. And, uh, and then you start with E and minus 1 and so on, and you construct an infinite family. And the, the object you obtain is, uh, is, an, is a called a helix. So uh, if e, E1, En is the collection associated with L, the collection associated with a rotated oriented ray L equals a parallel foundation of a helix. And uh, let me also recall you that the, parallel, this, the same parallel foundation can be also described as an application of a self factor to the initial starting exceptional collection. So in this sense, we have a, a helix structure arising from this, from this data. Uh, I, how much time do I, do I have? Minus something, yeah. So, so it will be very, very, very short. Uh, the, the history is quite, uh, is quite uh, uh, long, uh, the history of evolution of a conjecture. Let me give just uh, three, uh, three, some comments, the most important. So first of all, about the final assumption. You see, originally, in the original version of the conjecture, it was claimed that uh, the condition of being Fano was equi is equivalent to be uh, to have a qu semi-simple quantum cohomology. Well, indeed, both arrows are false. Uh, one is due, uh, for example, there exist Fano manifolds, Fano varieties with, with non-semi-simple quantum cohomology. An example: take one of the 47 families of Fano threefolds with a third Betty number greater than zero. According to a theorem, theorem by Ertley, Manning, and Telemann, uh, uh, necessarily uh, the quantum cohomology cannot be semi-simple. Uh, on the other hand, if you start with a variety with semi-simple quantum cohomology, Bayer proved that uh, the semi-simplicity is preserved uh, by blow-ups. So even if I start by a FANO, I repeatedly blow up, I don't know, several points, um, you may obtain a non fano variety still with semi-simple quantum cohomology. Uh, let me also say that it is not exactly clear uh, so what, how the FANO condition really um, behaves uh, we, inside this conjecture. You see, in the statement of a conjecture, we decided to put we decided to put the FANO condition. But it is not exactly clear. I will uh, give you an example of a non-FANO case for which such a conjecture holds in the next talk. Uh, uh, just two comments to finish. Uh, an another comment was the following. In the, original, in the original formulation of a conjecture, the Stokes matrix was a claim to equal not the inverse of a gram matrix, but the gram matrix itself of an exceptional collection. So is there any contradiction? No, there is not, because what is changing uh, is the exceptional collection. In particular, if E, this gothic E, is the collection for which the, the previous statement of Dubrovin conjecture holds, then this modified and actually original statement of a conjecture still holds for, a co for the collection E prime, where E prime is defined as follows. It's a, a suitable, so you take E, you consider the dual, so you take the dual of the objects and you reverse the order, and then you applied these uh, particular mutations of, 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 the, of the objects. Uh, so this is just to say that the original formulation is still compatible with this new one. It just changed the exceptional collection. 
And uh, finally, uh, finally uh, let me say that uh, indeed, uh, uh, in 1998, Dubrovin uh, was not uh, able to identify uh, what should be the conjectural formula for the connection matrix. Uh, and this was uh, uh, indeed a part of my work uh, for, uh, before as a master and then as a PhD student. And uh, let me also say that, uh, uh, as I told you, uh, these data are defined up to several choices of non-canonical non choices of normalization. In particular, uh, this central connection matrix is computed with respect to, to which fundamental system of solution? Well, a very remarkable one, which is a generating function for Gromovitten invariance with gravitational descendants, with descendants. Uh, I, I finish by saying that indeed in 2014, Galkin, Golishov and Diritani formulated uh, um, a very interesting, that was a very interesting paper, uh, what is called the Gamma Conjecture 2. Indeed, uh, that is a refinement which is, uh, uh, at the end of the day, equivalent with uh, the, the statement of Dubrovin conjecture I showed you before, but it is uh, uh, a conjectural statement uh, which works under different choices, for example, of, of, uh, of solutions in level normal forms, which from the point of view of Frobenius manifolds theory are not the natural ones. And uh, this also, let me also say that uh, the co exceptional collections that arise from the previous statement of Dubrovin conjecture and the statement of gamma conjecture two are also different. In particular, are one the dual of the other. And I think that this is a natural point where to stop. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the beautiful talk. We look to the second talk, the new result. Um, are there questions? And I forgot to remark that so, well, I, I was just thinking about the, the theorem that you proved about the convergence of the gromov witten potential, that uh, it, it's written there that uh, you ask that the quantum cohomology at the zero point is semi-simple. But, but then I, I was thinking, at the beginning of the talk, uh, we were speaking of uh, this quantum cohomology as a deformation of the usual uh, cohomology ring. So in a certain sense, can we expect also that under this deformation, there will still be some uh, non-semi-simple point? So, uh, so uh, I mean, uh, of course, if you start from a, from a, from a non-semi-simple algebra, as cohomology algebra is, because, of course, in the classical cohomology algebra, you have uh, you have uh, nilpotents. Of course, in general, if you deform such, a, such, a, such an algebra, the most generic deformation is not, uh, I mean, you obtain a semi-simple algebra, but there are cases, of course, in which, uh, in which you still have uh, nilpotency. Yes, so, but, but my question was probably, uh, I mean, you, you do the deformation and then you have some deformation parameters. So, so then for some parameters, we, we, I mean, there should be at least one parameter in which we expect to, to find the, the usual cohomology ring again, right? Or maybe I'm no, mistaken. You see, uh, okay, so uh, indeed uh, you can, uh, I don't remember if, uh, okay, so yes, indeed uh, I introduced quantum cohomology as a deformation of a classical cohomology. Um, indeed, there is, no, there is no finite value of the variables t, so there is no true points of the Frobenius manifolds at which, uh, in, in general, I am speaking in general, at which um, the corresponding Frobenius algebra equals the classical cohomological algebra. You can always recover the classical cohomological algebra at a limit point at infinity by taking, by setting equals zero all those coordinates which are not uh, corresponding to the H2 locus, to the small quantum cohomology locus. And uh, inside the small quantum cohomology, you have to go to the regime in which uh, 
the real parts of the coordinates t alpha goes to minus infinity. Why that? Because the dependence, uh, one can prove that uh, due to the, uh, to the property of gromov witten invariance called the divisor property, the, the behavior of this potential with respect to the coordinates to, uh, in the small quantum locus is of exponential behavior. So from here you realize that you, you can understand that why at a limit point, because only at the point at infinity you can, you can put equal zero this exponential term, you see? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have also two related questions. Uh, the first is also about convergence. Um, are there results which give some large convergence domain? I think in PN we have results of the provenant physicist. And I want to apply this then to the second question, um, which is probably a bit unfriendly, about the quantitative part of the provenance conjecture. You have this map from L chambers to the accepted collections. And the question is, can you say something about injectivity or subjectivity? Probably this so would require natural. that. Uh, so two domain. natural questions. Um, so the first question was about uh, um, uh, convergence, convergence, convergence. So, uh, so your, your question was about uh, uh, convergence on, on, on bigger domains. You see, um, you see, of course, working in the complex analytic category, we could consider analytic continuation of this, of this potential. Um, indeed, it would be better to define quantum cohomology not as the Frobenius manifold structure defined on omega, but actually on uh, its uh, possible maximal, um, so to say, uh, so to say, um, so this, this Gromowitten potential will admit an analytic uh, continuation on a, a maximal uh, cover of, of omega. And it would be better to call that so the Frobenius structure defined on that maximal cover uh, the quantum cohomology. Um, not sure, does this answer to your question, more or less? I think there are some other results. I mean, the physicist, the Bovin had some precise estimates for the N and the Ritman had some results. Uh, so, mm, so, uh, I don't remember if it's such a big generality, you see. Uh, Not generality, but just some results. Ah, well, okay, yes, some, uh, so there are some results uh, on conversions. Um, so, I prefer to think about, I prefer to think about. Uh, I will tell you, now, um, you know, for example, there are, you see, there is an open conjecture, a large, re, a large radius conjecture, according which, in the case of Calabiao, uh, in the case of Calabiao, for example, it is conjectured, it is conjectured that the potential is convergent in a certain region of the, in, um, of the point at infinity, the point I was speaking about. But, uh, Mm, right now, I don't remember any particular deep result mm, confirming this conjecture, but I will think about it. The second question, a very natural question. So, I said, uh, so, you have a map, you have a map uh, from L Chambers and full exceptional collection. Your question is, any statement about injectivity? Well, in general, we cannot say anything. You see, this, prob this problem is uh, strictly related to the problem of, uh, to the following problem. Is the braid group action um, on the set of full exceptional collection a free action? Well, uh, it, is, uh, it is an open problem. I, it is known, I remember that uh, I spoke about that with Sasha Kuznetsov in, some years ago in Trieste, and he told me some, something like that. 
uh, for in the, it is known, for example, in the case of projective spaces, on, that uh, the action of a braid group is free only for P2 and maybe for P3. But as far as I remember, it was not able to point out a precise um, point in literature where this result can be found. So uh, it is a, a very interesting question, but there is no clue. Also not, for example, also subjectivity. Is it true or not that all full exceptional collections arise from some chamber? This problem as well is an open problem and it is related to uh, the transitivity of a, of a braid group action on the set of full exceptional collections. Uh, in other words, is it true or not that all exceptional collections are in the same orbit of the action of a braid group? This is not known in general. Mm, in general, one, can, one cannot even expect it to be true. There are examples of abelian categories uh, Who's a, who's a, uh, so you, you start from an abelian category and you take its derived category and uh, you, you, you can study in this uh, grid generality. Is it true or not that the braid group action is transitive on the set of full exceptional collections? Well, in general, it is not true. There are, there, there are known counterexamples to that. So it is a big problem, two big open problems. and. Uh, Okay, thank you very much and let's take the speaker again.